So uh, we, we were saying before I hit record, it's uh, I didn't know that you were writing a book or had a book, I guess, already written since the last time we talked. But it's uh, it's good catching up and getting to know you a little bit better over the last couple of months. Um, just for the listeners, what made you decide to write a, a sales book? Because there's a lot of sales books out there. And I'm sure you were thinking about this, you know, how this kind of fits into the ecosystem <laughs> that is sales books and everything that's out there. What made you decide to write a book? Yeah. And if you enter into writing a book and you don't have some degree of imposter syndrome, I think you're kind of lying to yourself at this point uh, because yeah. there's so much ground that's already been covered. Right. Um, and I didn't really set out to write it initially. Kind of the steps that got put in place were I had led a sales team and then CS team. So I moved from VP of sales to CRO role at my last company. And I was in that role for eight years total. And through that, there was a lot of trial and error, a lot of learnings, a lot of mistakes made along the way. Mm -hmm. And I had consolidated it into this 120 slide deck that I used yeah. for consulting some friends, businesses and VCs that I had known had asked me to help with their portfolio companies and asked me to explain a lot of what was going on and just to make sense of the world and, and educate other sales leaders on what I had done and the mistakes I had made, how I'd worked through it and some of the successes that we had had. I just need to build this giant deck that had all these assets and materials and explanations. And then it just kind of dawned on me one day, you know, this is the outline of a book because there's not a lot of yeah. what's mixed together in here. And it was the natural next step of a lot of the books that I had read. So had some friends that had some connections in publishing and knocked on the door of Wiley. They were the only publisher I went to. And they said, yeah, that looks like a book. Let's go. And then not, awesome. nine months later, my, my baby was born. And uh, for those of the uh, of you listening that can't see Matt, you have all your hair still too. So uh, <laughs> yeah, although uh, I get accused for being a wig <laughs> or colored at this age, but yeah, it's all natural. <laughs> um, let's dig into because uh, I would totally agree with you. I mean, I haven't read every sales B two B sales book, but I've I've read a lot of them, and um, I think one of the things that sticks out to me about your book, um, from what I've read so far, is it's. I mean, process, the word process, like that is not something that is typically talked about a lot in books. There's usually either just a lot of like, you know, tactics and like bite-sized things to do with no kind of strategy or anything else like that. Or it's just so theoretical that you kind of don't really understand what to do with it. And if I had to use a word, I would, I would use the word blueprint, you know, for building something, a repeatable sales process and something that, you know, built by someone that has the experience of doing it, mm -hmm. you know, which I think is really interesting. So you have these like six systems. I figured what we could do is just kind of walk through the six elements of the process. So do you want to share what those six systems are? And then let's spend some time digging into each of them. Yeah. And full disclosure, I come from the Mark Robert's tree of coaching. So I saw was that. fortunate enough to you even you got know, an endorsement on your book from him, dude. I thought I, I saw that. I was like, good for you. Yeah. Yeah. I still keep in touch with Mark. And, um, you know, I had the benefit of being at HubSpot well before HubSpot was the multinational national Goliath that it is today. So yeah. We are all just in one office and I got the chance to really work side by side with Mark on a lot of stuff, had him on my calls, learned directly from him. It was great and was able to knock on his door a lot when I was scaling up rock content where most of the learnings from the book came from. So I'm standing on the shoulders of some pretty reputable giants with a lot of this stuff and a lot yeah. of revenue revolution, all the stories that come from the book are really me trying to implement a lot of those learnings, especially a lot of the learnings from sales acceleration formula, Mark's book, uh, as well as many others that you know, I put them in place and, you know, started with the great theory and some of the past history that I had worked with. And sometimes it worked right out of the gate. Most of the time there was a lot of iteration and a yeah. lot of the time there was just flat out fall on my face failure and go back to the drawing board and rebuild. Um, so really what came out of me trying to make sense of this all, as you'd mentioned, the six systems, which interlock and have a logical sequence to them when you look at the, the logic of how to build them and why to build them. 
And the way I look at them is really stacking on top of one another. That foundational system is process. So it's really understanding who's your buyer, who's your ICP, who's the, who's the customer that you aim to serve and why. And then what is the decision-making process that they need to go through, that buyer's journey that they need to go through to decide, yep, there's value in what you do. I have this problem. The solution fits and your business is, is the best fit of a solution and really building a process on top of that. That has to be system one. We could talk a little bit more as to why that has to be system one, if you'd like. System two is demand generation. How are we going to get those customers coming in? Where are they coming from? How many? What are all the metrics that go along with that? What's the right mix in demand generation? And this is a revenue issue. I know marketing usually owns that, but obviously revenue has a huge stake in that. So we as sales or revenue leaders need to be very mindful of that collaboration with marketing if we don't own it outright. System three is the people system. So that's who's the great fit. The other ICP, I call it ideal candidate profile. Who's the great fit for my organization and why? How do we find them? And then it's a completely different demand gen for people. How do we get mm -hmm. those great people into our system? How do we bring them in? How do we onboard them? Onboarding system is number four. That's system, system four. Now that we found those great people and hired them, how do we set them up for success? System five, ongoing improvement. Now that they're with us, we have the process, we have the demand, they've been onboarded. How do we keep that going to get 1% better and constantly improve and iterate over time? And then system, system six is internal alignment. Now that we got everything up and running and it's working and it's improving, how do we align first internally with our systems, SDRs to AEs, AEs to AMs, and get everyone playing in the same tune in sales, and then with the other teams, sales and CS, sales and marketing, sales and finance, sales and legal, all the different conversations that we have with other systems in the business. And snapping those all together and where they interlock and how they overlap and the rationale between all of them and, and where they fit together and where they don't. All of that is really, really critical when you're building this out. And sometimes when you pull a string in one system, something happens somewhere else and you need to understand the who, what, where, when, why, and how, and all of that. So a lot of the book, it really unpacks that process of me trying to just make sense of all of this while building it. Love it. Let's talk process. Cause it's, it's interesting. And I'm, I'm curious what you've seen too, at some very large companies that I've worked with the, like just even getting some consensus on what the pipeline stages are and like the exit criteria, just so that we're measuring the same thing and can really pinpoint if something's not working, what are the common mistakes that you see, you know, companies big or small make when they're either designing a sales process, redesigning it, implementing something new. What are some of the common mistakes or red flags? Yeah, the first one and the biggest uh, culprit in any process, I believe, is not looking at the process from the customer's point of view, really taking yeah. a myopic internal look of what do I want as a sales rep? What do we want as a business? and really having that be the driving force behind a process. When you start there, you mismatch a lot of what buyers need to make their decision effectively. And if you're not looking at it from the buyer's perspective, you're really not building a healthy process on solid footing because now you're setting yourself up for missing key components, being too salesy, being too self-serving and buyers, man, they can feel that and hear that now. And if you're not thinking about your buyer at every level of the process and your competition is, then you're going to lose and you're going to lose badly. So number one, biggest culprit there, not thinking of the process first from the buyer's perspective. What do they need? Where do they get educated? How do they get educated? What's their process of making decisions and why? And then how can I build a process around that to meet them where they are and very comfortably for them, get them to each step of that process from one step at a time. That's far and away number one. Number two is lack of measurement. So inside the process system 
I really spend a lot of time unpacking metrics and all the need to haves, especially what you're building inside CRM, you need to have fields and data gathering and pulling all that information together because there are going to be failures. There are going to be gaps. There are going to be weak spots. You're going to go back to your process and want to understand where can we do better? Why are we failing? What does it all look like? The, you know, the old Toyota five whys root cause analysis stuff. Yeah. If you don't have it pulled apart and measured effectively, then you're going to be looking for needles in haystacks. And if you don't set it up for success in the early days and start gathering that information as early as possible, you're just going to miss all the data that you need to analyze what's working and what isn't. And you're lost as far as trying to improve things later on. And there will always be the need to improve things later on. So you have to be thinking like in a chess match, three or four steps ahead of measuring that. Those are the two biggest things that I see repeatedly getting missed. As you had mentioned, even in some really evolved, mature systems. Mm -hmm. Do you have an example of being more customer centric in the sales process? Because I, I see a lot of stuff online, you know, when I say online, LinkedIn, really people griping over like the names of the sales stages, right? So instead of having a demo stage or a discovery stage, you know, making those more buyer centric type stuff, you know, uh, evaluation, decision, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so what does customer, what does a customer centric sales process look like versus something that's more buyer centric? So that's a great example, actually. And it's one I've, I've rarely seen, but we embodied it at Rock. We had it at HubSpot, naming those stages and names matter. And it primes the sales team to think yeah. differently about the work they're doing. So one of those is discovery, right? Mm -hmm. Nobody's sitting around waiting to be discovered. I, I don't need to be found. I found myself. Yeah. You know, discovery is for you, sales guy, not me. So yeah. what does it mean to me that you're asking me all these questions and trying to understand what's going on and name that something or come up with some sort of value proposition around that? And that impacts the conversation that demand gen, whether it's marketing or uh, BDRs, SDRs are having with those leads when they're opening up those conversations because they're not going to go into a, a cold call saying, hey, do you want to set up a discovery call? Or maybe they are, but they shouldn't because it's not... It's not valuable yeah. for the buyer. What's valuable for the buyer? Maybe it is a valuation assessment, call it whatever, is going to fit that buyer's narrative and make sure you're mm -hmm. delivering value at every stage of the process, especially early on, because sometimes you're not, you're not getting back a lot of value early. As the sales process matures, obviously, there's a lot more give, get. You're collaborating. You're working alongside a buyer. But early stage... You got to be thinking, what value is there for the buyer? Why do they want to show up? And what do I need to deliver throughout the process to make sure I'm delivering something that's making it worthwhile? So at every stage of the process, it's asking that question, why would I care about this as a buyer? So yeah. what? And if you can't effectively answer that question at each stage, you got to go back to the drawing board and build value in there. Yeah. Yeah, because... Oftentimes what I'll see too is, you know, t like 12 stages, you know, where it's just like, holy shit, man, yeah. there's just so much. It's so hard to follow versus keeping it very simple. I am a, a fan of keeping it as buyer centric as possible. You know, like explore fit is like intro call scheduled is my first stage. Second stage is explore fit, you know, uh, problem consensus. Do other people at the company agree that there's a problem? So I, I really really like that. So you said lack of measurement. Is this a, is the lack of measurement, how much of that has to do with the technology? And the reason I asked that is that I feel like there's, it's, it's kind of interesting in SaaS right now. There's been this like bubble that's burst in like this year in 2023, where people are starting to realize, Hey, do I need a different solution for sales engagement versus CRM versus call recording? versus revenue intelligence versus data versus, you know, yeah. it's like you look at the rep and when I would see these reps share their screens, when I'm in coaching calls, 
I'm like, they have like six different tools that they need to be in and out of every day. And there's definitely been a consolidation, you know, aspect of it. But how much of the measurement piece is, is technology and having the right stuff versus just making sure that what you have is set up properly? Far more the latter than the former. So there's an old yeah. saying, it's a poor carpenter who blames his tools, right? Um, <laughs> and I think it's the same in sales. Yeah. It's a poor sales rep who blames technology for failure. Yeah. And most of what I see missed is nothing to do with technology. Even basic CRM functionality can be used mm -hmm. to grab some of this stuff. Um, let me use myself as an example because I made most of these mistakes myself and egregiously so. So a couple of years into the gig of leading the sales team at Rock Content, I had probably 25 salespeople. We were running a small business sales process at that point. So it was velocity. We were selling seven, 10, 12 customers per month per sales rep, really high volume. That means a lot of deals were cycling through. And yeah. I just did not set up CRM to collect all of this data that my sales team was gathering from both wins and from losses. And like in any sales motion, you're going to lose more than you win. And just one day when there was a dip in inbound leads, we were looking for old opportunities to find to go rework. And I clicked on the close lost column and it had amounted to over 20,000 close lost records in there. And I wow. knew almost nothing about them. Almost nothing. I didn't even know the deal stage we lost them at. I didn't, we didn't have notes. We didn't have anything on what criteria the sales rep learned mm. along the way. Um, how far did it go through the process? How close were they to buy? Why didn't they buy? Like, I knew nothing. Um, and it occurred to me out of these 20,000, we were running a, a team at that point where we were selling something like 200 customers a month. Could I get 1% of that 20,000 to buy if I knew which 1% to go to? Absolutely. So there was at least a yeah. month's worth of business in there, but I had nowhere to go to look for it. And it wasn't rocket mm -hmm. science that we needed to have. We need to have basic qualification fields in there that I just didn't have, it didn't collect effectively. So you should be able to know at least that stuff. And I've seen many teams through my consultant work do the same thing, not have that same basic stuff here in 2023. And this is like, make, this is one of the first things I talk about, you know, are you gathering that information that you need to know exactly which ones you want to revisit and which ones you don't and why yeah. and getting all that granularity. And now with AI and auto filling records and data that's automatically pulled in, there's really no excuse from technology at all. But even without technology, you should be, we should be gathering this basic information. So that's a simple one. Yeah. And that's like so setting up a better mousetrap. It sounds like really is around certain things are forced. Um, we have closed lost. Like, Hey, if I mark a deal closed lost, it forces me to pick a reason and leave some notes in there like that kind of stuff. Yeah. And how to think about closed loss. So I did have that, but it was all just the generic, no urgency, but no budget. budget chose yeah. competitor without a list of which competitor like yeah and a lot of it was did not hear back because they just lost control of the deal and it didn't yeah. tell me anything that i needed to know um, like how close is this deal going to be if we call it back should this be one of the one percent of the closed loss deals that we should rework yeah. i don't know yeah how do you suggest if there's a sales org that's semi-mature has dozens or hundreds of reps and there is not a lot of compliance around data hygiene in CRM. Like I notice a lot of enterprise sales motions. I mean, they don't even keep notes on the deal. They don't mark any calls, activity, who's a part of it, like none of that stuff. Like a lot of these reps will keep all of this stuff on like a Google doc. Yep. Is there anything that you recommend that a sales organization do that wants to increase the, you know, kind of hygiene of the database? Yeah. So let's talk about two scenarios here. One is the one you're mm -hmm. talking about. So hundreds of reps, that means you have some resources, you have an ops team, you probably have an enablement yeah. team. You got some stuff that you could plug together. And today you can make this not only easy for the rep, but you don't even need to include the rep because you're recording your calls. You can have the notes taken and you can have those notes auto-populate inside CRM. 
you could effectively take yeah. the rep out of the equation all together with technology and just have all of that information auto populate into fields inside CRM without asking the rep to do anything. And that would be my first option. Let's minimize the ask and the human interaction from that to automate it so we can trust the integrity of that information as much as we possibly can. If you don't have that, the other end, the other side of that spectrum is small business, don't have ops, don't have resources, not going to go buy something to do that. Need to have my salespeople be great stewards of data and process. You're probably still using CRM because you can use CRM for free now. Lock the box. And the simple way to do that is you can't move deals forward without first entering in these locked fields that are going to pop up and say, populate yep. this, populate this, populate this. Now that's human interaction and anything that people are involved in invites a certain level of, how should we put this to not really completely shit on salespeople, creative <laughs> license with what they interpret yeah. as truth. Um, yeah. So you're getting that human interaction and that human involvement. You have to take the information somewhat yeah. with a grain of salt. Um, but that's the next, it's yeah. far better than just have it be completely open season, which is what I was doing years ago before yeah. I woke up to this. Yeah. Love it. So that's process. Number one, let's talk about demand gen. I think specifically, I'm just thinking of situations that people might be in, you know, if I'm a sales leader thinking about like a common scenario I'll see is next year, we need to grow by X percent. And it's usually a multiple you know, we need to grow by two X next year. Yep. And the demand gen piece is, Hey, reps have traditionally gotten 80 to 90% from inbound and SDRs. And now that piece is not really going to pick up. We're not going to double the head count. We're probably not going to double our marketing spend. Now it's like account executives need to self-source more. How do you, how do you kind of think about, or how would you recommend a sales leader really sit down and plan you know, what needs to come from inbound in marketing versus self-generated through outbound and like what that right mix is or how to think about it at least. Yeah. The first thing for context here is this is system two for a reason because a lot of teams, mm -hmm. and I made this mistake too, a lot of teams out there right now have the people system, the hiring system, the body count system as system two because they'll extrapolate that growth on the spreadsheet and then they'll say, okay, yeah. we got to go hire the salespeople, find and hire them and plug them into that spreadsheet in time so they ramp. And then demand gen comes after that. We'll figure out how they're going to get the opportunities they need to survive and hit number and, and grow. That's backwards. And I made that mistake and I've seen a lot of teams do that. If you do not figure out demand gen before the hiring, you're setting up hiring to later be firing. You absolutely are. Yeah. It won't automatically figure itself out. So that's number one. Number two, there are basic principles of unit economics that you have to consider. So there's this age old spreadsheet from a great venture capitalist named David Scock, Matrix Ventures, Boston guy out here in, uh, in my hometown where I used it for years. It was built for a SaaS model, but I've actually re-engineered it to apply to any business and kind of modified the SaaS principles to apply anywhere. And the beauty of this Scock model of extrapolating sales teams is you can only afford to do so much. You have to know where the limits mm -hmm. are. So if you're running a small business, low ticket, high volume sales process, you can't have steak dinners and events be the mainstay of your demand gen. The economics aren't just going to work. So the first thing you need yeah. to do is understand how much of a customer acquisition cost can you actually outlay? And that's going to govern what you can do and how much you can do and really how little you can do to grow leads and grow demand and find your, your base of future customers. And with those parameters in place, now you have to look at your choices. What's available in the market based on all of that first work that you did in system one? Who's my customer? What's the persona? Where are they? Where do they educate themselves? How do I connect with them? And now with my choices of demand gen based on economics, which ones are the ones I'm going to bet on for leveling into and leaning into to generate demand? 
outbound I see today is a need to have for most B2B sales organizations. Yep. And more than ever, because we need to be multi-channel. We need to be diverse. Inbound is getting much, much more competitive and has really been saturated. Social selling is important, but that's tricky. Like everything is saturated now and customers are yeah. everywhere. And there is a force multiplier effect of having all these different channels play together. So if you lose, leave one out, it's not just cutting out that one, it's cutting out the effectiveness of the others as well. And everybody needs to yeah. understand that in most situations, these different channels play together. So you need to set yourself up after you've made that choice of how much can I afford to spend? Where am I going to spend it? What are the economics of demand gen? What do I need to come from where and by whom? And what are the rules of the game going to be before I go hire somebody and plug them into my system? So if you yeah. need half of your demand now generated from AEs who do self-sourcing, you need to let the AE know that before they sign on the dotted line when you hire them. Yeah. Because if they don't know that and they're coming in thinking it's all inbound, it's going to blow up in your face. So you need to have it yeah. and you need to have all the math baked out of we're going to deliver this. You're going to deliver that. Here are all the conversion rates. Here's how you get to your number. And if you can't answer that, here's how you get their number. Don't hire anyone until you can. Yeah. I want to double click on that point that you shared around, you know, there being a multiplier effect because there's always like this debate over like inbound versus outbound. And it's like the answer is to do everything because you're outbound. Like a huge red flag for me is helping a company that wants help with outbound and they have no inbound engine. They have no content on the website. They don't do any demand gen. I'm like that's a huge red flag. There's stuff that you have not figured out and there's no social proof because people will inevitably go to the website if they don't know who your company is. Right. If they don't see thought leadership and social proof, like they're not going to take a meeting with you, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but basically it sounds like the key here is like really understand the, the, the CAC, the cost of acquisition. And I think a lot of people are finding right now because I, I hear this a lot and you know, people that reach out to me is like inbound has gotten more expensive. So they are needing people to do more outbound, but, and I'm starting to see this in job ads more, which is really promising where on the account executive job ad, it'll say, Hey, you're responsible for self-sourcing 50% of your pipeline. So you're attracting the type of people that want to, or at least understand that they need to outbound because there's nothing worse for me as a trainer coming into a situation where I'm supposed to train these AEs to do outbound. And it's very clear that that has not been an expectation that's been set with them and everyone's just really resistant to it. Yeah. And you know, the biggest learning in the book that I keep coming back to again and again, is this idea of design build where, yep. you know, first bottoms up management doesn't work. And most organizations don't do that anyway. Bottoms up would be, Hey, let's just let reps, you know, be reps, hire them and they'll figure it all out. Most organizations, and I did this for most of my years, do top down. Let's build systems. Let's set playbooks. Let's get everything set up. Let's build a commission plan. And then we'll put that in the hands of the team and let them go. And that's a one-way conversation. And it doesn't really interact with and gather the intel and win the buy-in of the sales team who's actually going to be doing the work. Design mm -hmm. build has the architecture done from the people that are the systems builders, the ops people, the leaders, management, and then it brings the sales team in and says, hey, what are you gonna do with this? So this commission plan, this is what we're changing. What are you gonna do with this? How does this change the way you interpret the work? Or, you know, we, we need to now put outbound in and here's why. Tell me what you're thinking with that. How are you digesting that? How are you metabolizing it? Before you just assume, hey, you work for me, there you go, that's the new job, go. It doesn't work that way. You need to get the buy-in. Yeah. Otherwise, you're going to have people that just, at best, go through the motions and at worst, start yeah. looking for a new job. And you need yeah. to get them bought in to understand why they're doing it, why it makes sense, even if they don't like it. Not to say it's a democracy. You're not voting on it. But you got to listen to your customer. And for sales leadership, your customer is your team. Those are the ones that you are counting on to adopt your product, the sales system, and run with it. Yeah. Love it. So we got process, we got demand gen. Let's talk about people. Do you feel like companies could be pickier about the salespeople that they hire? Yeah, about a thousand percent. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, um, and it's funny to think of it. 
Uh, the best analogy I ever heard was if you go to a company with a $50,000 product, like your product mm -hmm. is worth 50000 they get a full buying committee involved. There are standard operating procedures. They do full evaluations, SWOT analysis, spreadsheets. They go through the rigors of a months long evaluation process. You know, if you're selling something that's worth 50,000 a year, that's probably a two, three month sales cycle in most cases. You go hire a sales rep that you're gonna spend 250,000 on. And it's like, oh yeah, we'll meet them a few times, like them, yeah, go ahead, get it, go ahead. And it's just like, that's it. They don't look at it yeah. with the same care and the investment is so much bigger because it's not just the, the capital that you're investing, it's the demand that you're putting in that rep and not the others. It's your brand for what that sales rep is gonna carry with him or her when talking to clients. It's the culture of the team. You're inviting a new human into that team. So that has a whole bag of tricks involved with it, with somebody else's personality that's adding into the team. Like there's so much more at stake and they just move so fast and so light through the process. And they use very limited data. So they try to operationalize it a little bit with some spreadsheets and scorecards, but the data is still pretty minimal. And yeah. That's a long-winded answer to say yes. Yeah. 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 And I ask that because I work with a lot of sales teams in very different sizes, but it's obvious the teams that like hire A players. It's so obvious. And it's not, rarely has to do with the size of the company. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting. Uh, what's Is there anything that's sort of non-obvious that you would recommend from a hiring standpoint that a company, company implement that, you know, is not hiring those A players right now and has some of the, for lack of a better word, debts <laughs> on, on the sales team. Any any non-obvious things you recommend that they implement? Yeah, so doing? Um, there is now a way to quantifiably and objectively test not only for sales skills, but for soft skills. So I would advise set out some homework assignments early stage in the interview process and say, hey, we'd like you to take these courses and study up on these types of sales methodologies and measure everything that you're gonna send them and then watch what they do. Are you getting somebody who kind of blows it off? Are you getting somebody who doesn't do it until the night before the interview and does it just to make it look good? Or are you getting somebody who is methodical about going through those assignments and is really engaged and studies them and passes them and showing you that they're plugged in? So start to get that, that process of here's how we run. We invest a lot in training and in coaching, and there's a lot to learn. And then watch the behavior and see how they take it. And once you do that, you learn how quickly does somebody adopt new processes? How willing are they to learn? How do they score on those? And then how quickly do they do it? And what is their behavior of doing that work? Because that's what you're really trying to understand. What is somebody's behavior as to how they work? It's really telling when you start doing that. We started doing it about 18 months before I left my last business. We had a good year and a half mm -hmm. of it, and it was eye-opening, especially in sales, because salespeople are really good at interviewing in the short term. Oh, yeah. So you get, you get to read the behaviors, and if you can get objective criteria on behavior, um, that's the best way. You know, I wonder also, I love that. I wonder... You know, Dan Martell, I learned this from his content, He's or from his book, I think it was uh, Buy Your Time Back or Buy Back Time. I can't forget what his news, this book is called. But he talked about, you know, never hire someone without having worked with them. You know, so, and I run a tiny company, but the, the principle for me is test project. Like when I was hiring an uh, EA, the way that I found Brittany or current EA is, like there were three A's, EAs I was looking at and I paid them three of them for just small test project. Yeah. Hey, I have something that's going to take an hour. I'll pay a hundred bucks for it. Like, here's what I'm looking for. And then I just got to see what it was like to interact and work with them on something. And I feel like there's an equivalent of that for salespeople where maybe you're not having them run a deal, but I just like you hire an enterprise sales rep and all you have to go off of is a couple of references, your interactions with them, and then how they perform in a role play. 
it seems like there would be something that you could do to test a little bit more and pay them for it. It doesn't have to be a crazy amount of money. And by the way, I have no evidence to back that up or anything like that. It's just like, it seems like there's something there because what I don't like is, and I see companies do this too, is they give a lot of work to the rep and they make them do things for free, like write emails for them yep. and write messaging and stuff. I'm like, you shouldn't like have them bring what they use at their current company. Don't make them do free work for you and find prospects. Like I hate that, you know? <laughs> yep. So I don't know. I don't know. What are your, what are your thoughts on that? So I've never seen it on the individual contributor level. I'm not sure what that would look like beyond what you just mentioned, which is, mm. You know, I'm going to go through role plays and meet with everybody and that pre-test work that I'd mentioned on the senior leadership level. It's something that I've advised portfolio companies, the VCs I work with, never hire a senior level if you don't have to before you get some consulting work. So get them to come yeah. in, pay yeah. them for just say, hey, this is something we're working on. This is a priority for us. We want to uh, consult it, quote it, tell us your process and get a real window yep. and a snapshot into how that senior executive works. And they get to know you as well. So they get the window into that. So there are no surprises when a decision is made. So you get that little try before you buy test yeah. and they get it too. And especially with senior level executives, it's such a big buy-in and such a big investment and commitment for both parties. You really want to to try to get that in place whenever you possibly can. I see, yeah. I don't know. I haven't really seen anything there that's worked really well. And it's probably harder to scale on the IC level, but I love that for senior leaders because you'll tell right away if someone wants that VP of sales or CRO job, it's you pay them for a, a project that will take a week or two and just work with them. So much of what I've seen, because I have hired a lot of salespeople in my day is there's so much about a person's personality that you just don't even see until they start to run into something they don't know how to figure out and just like dealing with adversity and how they respond to feedback. It's like so much of that is so hard to tell, you know, in the interview process. Um, I want to keep the train going. So we got process, demand gen, people. Um, let's talk about new hires and onboarding. There's, there was the, biggest focus. I'm hearing about it less now because I feel like the SaaS, the pressure on these VC backed SaaS companies has been more around profitability lately <laughs> than it has been around a grow at all costs. So I don't hear reducing ring of time being as much of a focus, but what are your thoughts on, on ramp time at some point is, is it like, Hey, can we really ramp up a new rep quicker than 30 days? I mean, you know what I mean? Like, how should we think about ramp and defining ramp too, because just because someone's out there doing the job doesn't mean that they're fully ramped. So how do you, how do you kind of think about that? Yeah. So there are three criteria that I use. And I talk a lot about this in the book as well. Three criteria that I used eventually after I finally figured out a system that worked there to determine ramp. One is sales cycle. So if you're dropping somebody into a system, what is the sales cycle that you either have known from previous deals, or if this is brand new, it's speculating what is the, the target if it's a new team. Two is the conversion rates in the funnel that you're going to give them for demand generation. So that is just math that you're putting over in a waterfall month over month. That goes back to that demand gen system. This is why you need demand gen before you hire people. So you have that all mapped out month over month. So it overlays the sales cycle and you can start to see based on those volume of deals they're going to get, what is it that you expect them to convert and what's the sales cycle that'll give you the revenue delivery on that. And then the third is how generous are you going to be with some shit? I don't know this job and I'm going to figure this out time. How much are you going to yeah. draw back the conversion rates from a new hire versus a fully ramped hire and give them some grace period of getting to that fully ramped quota? And that's case by case. And that really goes down to some economics as well. How much can you tolerate going into the hole on a new sales rep? Because we all do. How long can you go into that trough before you come back out and start to break even on a rep? And that's, again, a basic economics thing. That stock sheet I mentioned earlier covers a lot of that as well. Because you go hire 10 salespeople in a quarter, 
you're probably biting off a seven figure hole that you're going to have to dig yourself out of at some point over the next 12 months. You got to know what that investment is and if you can afford it. And a lot of that is going to adjust how many people you can actually hire and how long you can be generous on that ramp. So those are the three criteria I would ask everyone to consider. Two are just math, pure math. Yeah. Put it together with the cycle and then the demand gen criteria and conversion rates. And then the third is, what am I going to shave off of this and give some ease to that new hire to let them have that, oh shit time. I don't know what I'm doing. And I screwed up the deal. Love it. So sales cycle time, conversion rates, and then the the generosity that we're going to give for new hires. Um, so five is ongoing improvement. You know, enablement is it's really interesting because I've seen enablement means so many different things at so many different companies. Sometimes enablement, there's a culture where enablement does a lot of the training and they're very hands on. And I'm a really big fan of enablement kind of, you know, taking a back seat to highlighting reps and leaders like people that are in the field doing the thing because hey if i'm being real if i'm a rep do i want to hear an enablement person talk about cold calling when they've never made a cold call before no that's not the best person to teach it but they can be a really good facilitator yep and getting the content and teasing it out and that sort of stuff but what does what does good ongoing improvement look like in a sales org yeah and this is something that i barely see anywhere um, but it's something, it's a, it's a, a trend that is, it has to start to take hold now with everybody moving in the direction of, uh, revenue efficiency versus just overall revenue growth. We need to use our teams more effectively and integrate them better. So what I'm getting at here is we have three teams that typically sit in three separate silos that need to collaborate better. Sales enablement, sales management, and sales operations. They work in their own worlds and sometimes they talk to each other and overlap. These need to be three independent units that are working together and have their vectors lined up. And with sales operations, they can circle the problem really well. If they're set up the right way, they can look at exactly where the crack in the system is and what needs to be focused on. The conversion rate from here to here is broken. The average sales si cycle is this to that and needs to shorten. Or average ticket has dropped and here's why. Sales enablement isn't great at localizing. They're not data people, but they can go out and get the resources on how to fix. So they can run out to the hardware store, pick up all the stuff that you need to fix the leaky roof, and make sure that the clapboards are there, the roofing is there, all of the, the stuff that you need to fix it. But doing the work of fixing it is best done by the sales manager because that sales manager knows how to take where the localization is of the, the problem, have the resources, which the sales manager isn't going to run down training resources, run that down and then have that one-on-one -on -one conversation because maybe when we get to the individual level, Jason's problem is different than Matt's problem. And we need to figure out exactly how to do that. That's what coaching is all about. So if the problem is localized on demo to one rate, we have a big problem. We're losing the demo to one rate. We got to increase our conversion there. Maybe Matt just sucks at demoing. The rest of his process is pretty good. He's just not telling a great story. Maybe Jay is actually great at demoing, but he's missing some components on discovery, which is why he's actually tripping up in the demo. So it's the same localized area that we're seeing show up, but two different root causes. The manager yeah. can see that. The manager can yeah. uncover that and the manager can work on that with the support of ops data and the direction and guidance of ops and all of that material and great resource building from enablement. And then the execution is done by management and then the cycle repeats. Where do we go again next? What do we localize next? Enablement, help me out. Sales manager drives it home. Yeah, I love that. God, that right there, if more companies implemented a, a process like that where those three parties work better together, it'd make a huge difference. The, uh, God, the frontline manager is so neglected at these companies. They get hardly any training. Least trained professional, maybe in the professional world, right? 
It's yeah. you sold well. We're going to make you a manager. Go make more people like you. Yeah. <laughs> it's, like, it's crazy. Why do you think companies are not sold on investing into that? Because th there are companies that spend multi seven and eight figures on training their reps and then nil on their on their frontline leaders. What do you what do you think is the the mindset behind that? Yeah, I think it's uh, it is a vicious cycle that a lot of teams get into first partly because of speed. So nobody's just getting promoted up for fun. There's usually some urgent need for it. Hey, we're moving fast. Yeah. We're growing. We need somebody just left and we need to replace the seat or we're growing and we need a new manager to head up a new team. It's you. Let's go. So they don't think and play the long game. And as humans, we don't do that anyway. I mean, we all know yeah. climate is changing. We don't do anything about it. You know, I'm not driving a Prius. Yeah. So, you know, whatever. Uh, but, yeah. you know, we're just lousy at thinking of long game, long term thinking. Yeah. Uh, that's part of it. And another part of it is there's still this mindset where most people think sales is this black box magic show where it's inborn nature and people just know how to do it and they're hardwired a certain way. And that's what it is. And we just have to try to get some of that charisma out there. So we're going to hire the charismatic leader that can motivate and teach people the magic show that he or she did. And they don't think of the science behind it and the engineering behind it and the nurture behind yeah. it. That's a lot more work to do that. You have to really... Yeah take a lot of time and be careful and dedicated and think about the curriculum of what a manager needs. And if you weren't brought up that way, which no manager is in sales, then yeah. you don't know any better because you didn't come through that way. You were just a great rep that got promoted. So you do what you, you came from. So it's this yeah. confirmation bias of, well, this is how I did it. So this is how I'm going to do it. And we don't think about that next evolutionary step that's needed. Yeah. All right. One more internal alignment. What, uh, what insight do you have for us around, you know, making sure that our sales work is more aligned? Yeah. So this is really where a lot of things start to break down. So yeah. after you get these other five systems in place, businesses are going to flex, they're going to grow, they're going to contract, they're going to get into new markets, they're going to be new competitors, economics are going to change. Everything is in this constant state of flow. So for sales, we all know sales and marketing alignment come into play. We've known that for years. We've got to get those two teams talking clearly. Sales and product or customer success, well, that's the downstream effect. If you're not talking about where your customers are going, first you're doing this huge disservice when you're signing them because you should be building out this, this success plan as part of your sales process. It doesn't matter how contracted it is. Any process needs to be talking about where are you going to go with us? What journey are you yeah. going on and how are we going to help you get there? So you need to have that alignment and you need to get that feedback from those teams to tell you how it's going. Sales and even legal, you got to get talking. I see so much friction going back and forth between terms and conditions and legal and yeah. what they improve and what they don't approve. And it slows things down. Sales is always pulling their hair out and legal is spending way too much time and they're you know, up until midnight at the last day of the month, that doesn't need to happen. You just need to get them talking to smooth out those, those different bumps in the road. HR has their hands in everything. And if you don't have sales aligned with HR, then you miss opportunities to get great new hires into your people system to fuel your growth. And you miss the connection between, hey, how are we doing? We're in this honeymoon phase when people join the team. Are we still there? How's the marriage going? Uh, do we need some counseling or we need to move things in a different direction? That's all part of that design build of constantly getting tight feedback loops from your team. You need to be talking to HR. You need to have everybody involved and they need to know what you're doing so they can help you be as successful as possible. So everybody should be helping out with demand gen. Everybody should be helping out with sales. It should take a village to bring in customers. So if you have that alignment, you're really working on a team that's a force multiplier together and it's an order of magnitude more powerful than everybody just in their own little silo working by themselves not helping one another and then things will break when the systems start to change and the economies start to move and the business starts to scale love it 
Dude, this has been a freaking deep dive, dude. <laughs> so we got sales process, demand gen, people, onboarding, ongoing improvement, and then lastly, internal alignment. Yeah. So we're uh, we're out of time. This is great, Matt. Um, where can people go to pick up your new book, Revenue Revolution? Easiest way is Amazon. So give some more money to Bezos. He's uh, he's strapped for cash. So go to Amazon Revenue Revolution. It's in Barnes and Noble. It's in most places that you could find books. And where can people go to connect with you and learn more about what you're doing and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, the best two ways are LinkedIn. Check me out, Matt Doyen. Um, I should be the only one that you're going to find out there. It's a pretty unique name, D-O-Y-O-N. And then triplesession.com. You can jump in there, uh, sign up for free. You'll go into our newsletter list. We'll never sell your information to anyone. It's safe, secure forever. And you'll be into all of our free course information. So we give a lot of way, give away a lot of free courses on prospecting and discovery and connecting and all the stuff that we need to know in sales. Uh, there's a lot of free course information there if you want to start studying and start working out on your sales skills. Yeah, we uh, we did a triple session together. Uh, I forget, was that a multi-threading or a cold calling? Uh, that was a one of those, webinar, yeah. so that wasn't in our library. Oh, okay. Uh, but that was a webinar we did on multi-threading. Yeah, we have tons of content on multi-threading. Right. It's a huge topic. It's something everyone needs to know. So you can get in there and yep. start studying on that for free. Yeah, make sure to check it out. Matt likes to get super tactical, which I which I like. So it's uh, it, it helps a ton. Um, Matt, thanks for coming on the show. This was great. Thanks for having me.